let's move on to uh, how the landscape of CINV therapies have changed in the last few years. Um, I think if you look at the whole field, uh, we started in the 1980s with the first drug that was developed uh, that helped CINV, and that was high-dose metoclopramide, not a drug that we use anymore. It had a lot of toxicity, but at least it made an impact. And then came the 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, which truly transformed the field in the early 90s. Um, over the last 10 years, there's been some uh, additional advances, and we want to talk about those with our audience. So, Jim, you want to talk to us about the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists and uh, some of the drugs we have available now? Sure. Um, I'll start with, uh, I guess, what most co we most commonly refer to as first or second generation uh, 5-HT3s. Uh, the first generation agents uh, being on Dancitron, Gernicitron, and Delacitron, with the second generation agent being Pelinositron. Uh, I think pelinostrone, uh, or what uh, the brand name Aloxy, um, has made uh, an impact uh, in the control and prevention of CANV uh, on a number of uh, different levels um, from both the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, standpoint. Um, it certainly has a longer half-life, uh, sticks around longer. Uh, there are at least some uh, uh, lab studies that show that may have different binding uh, parameters to the receptors. Um, certainly in clinical trials, uh, it's been compared to the first generation agents both in MEC and HEC, uh, MEC being moderately metagenic and HEC being highly metagenic, uh, which shows um, better responses or better control, I should say, uh, in uh, the delayed phase as well as overall phases uh, and equivalent uh, efficacy in the acute phase. So in your institution, are you predominantly using palinocitron? We are. Yeah. Eric, what, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I favor palinocitron as well um, from the patient perspective, uh, but I think something that's really important for everyone out there to realize, and I see this happening all the time, is they'll get palinocitron as their prophylactic medication, and then for breakthrough, I'm unfortunately seeing people giving andansetron. So once that 5-HT3 uh, receptor is uh, saturated, you know, adding more uh, Zofran or andansetron on top of that doesn't work. Um, so I think it's important for when you're thinking about your breakthrough medications that you're thinking about a different class of medication. In the same way when you approach like blood pressure, you're going to take hydrochlorothiazide, and if that's not working, you're going to take a different class of medication, not just keep adding the same. Um, but what the advantage of that is, is that you just get that one, that one time with Palo and you're pretty much protected for 72 hours, which um, of course is really nice for the patient. So that's, that's a really important point because we also know that in, with the first generation agents, when they were given day after day, there was really very little um, effectiveness after day one. So there's a difference perhaps with the uh, receptor occupancy or the receptor interaction as well as the long half-life. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the clinical trial data. Uh, you've been involved in those clinical trials. Um, from the original palinocitron studies, and do you have any comments about that? Actually, not the palo. This goes back way far back to the serotonin antagonist and, right. and metoclopramide trials. <laughs> You've been there from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> It's, it's the same concept of even yes. the drugs themselves. If, mm -hmm. if you look at package insert of ondansetron, you'll see it's still the original dosing of you know, three times a day. Nobody does that anymore. It's, it's all once a day dosing. It's the same concept. You saturate the receptors, they're saturated. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, you, you, they all have a plateau effect. I think we should point out, though, the guidelines don't really distinguish uh, between the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, except some guidelines prefer the PALO. Yeah. But um, in certain institutions where uh, you're restricted on which ones you can choose. The key is that you're making sure that that is scheduled and not breakthrough um, in that um, highly emetogenic situation and moderate emetogenic situation. So, so I, yeah. I might add in that, that I use palinocitron often, often, and it's a good drug for there. If you're using uh, for an NK, for a moderately metagenic and you happen to use an NK1 receptor antagonist, you probably don't need the palinocitron in there because they're both pretty expensive medications and we have to think about the financial implications for these things. Um, but, uh, and if we go, and the guidelines suggest if you're going to highly metagenic chemotherapy where you use an NK1 receptor antagonist, you can use any of the, of the 5 ht 3 receptor antagonist in that particular setting. But if you're using it without, then the palinocitron is, is clearly, clearly better. So I think we have to keep that into perspective mm -hmm. with things. Right, so we don't have a lot. So the, the data on uh, Palo, either alone or with 
uh, dexamethasone, which is typically given as the, as the third group of agents that we typically use for prophylaxis for CINV, showed superiority, particularly in the delayed phase. Mm -hmm. um, so we have limited data in the three-drug regimen, but uh, the data as yet doesn't support a clear-cut superiority.